Hello, hello, and welcome to my beginner's guide to mantis keeping. So you've decided a praying mantis is something you'd be interested in keeping, and it's a great choice in my opinion, as these are one of the most fascinating insects you can have. Their upkeep isn't too demanding, they're not too expensive, and for some species you don't need much expertise providing you follow some basic guidance. So the first thing you might ask is what species do I get? There's around 2,300 species of mantis in the world and a large array are available from independent stores, particularly online. However, unless you have prior experience with these insects, it's strongly advised that you stick to the more hardy species for your first purchase. Personally, I'd recommend the giant Asian mantis. These don't have any specialised requirements, they're ravenous eaters which grow to an impressive size. They're fairly docile and not too skittish, which makes handling them much easier. Another species to consider is the ghost mantis. These eerie looking mantis won't get as big as the giant Asian mantis, but they look stunning and come in a range of different colours. They also readily dance, imitating a swaying leaf in the wind, a defence tactic to dissuade any potential predators. There are some other hardy beginner species out there, but these two are the most readily available and widely recommended to get started with the hobby. Therefore, the following advice will apply to these beginner species only. If you have a more specialised species, please do your own research and ensure you're providing the correct care as they may have different or additional requirements. So how big does your enclosure need to be? A general rule of thumb is that your enclosure height should be three times the length of the mantis. When they molt, they'll hang upside down and need space to be able to slide out of their former exoskeleton. Remember, mantids can grow a lot, so you might need to prepare different sized enclosures as they go through their life cycle. Regarding what type of enclosure is best, anything of the appropriate size is fine, whether it's a branded design, a plastic container, or something you custom built. Just make sure there's some form of ventilation to prevent potential stagnant air and mold growth, and don't keep your mantid in the dark as you want to imitate natural daylight cycles, as they would expect in the wild. Please don't place your enclosure in direct sunlight, as this could result in the mantis dying from exposure or overheating. Your mantis will spend most of its time hanging upside down, and they'll gravitate towards height, so just ensure you've given your mantis a way to climb to the top of its enclosure as they can struggle to grip on smooth surfaces. You should provide some form of canopy at the top as a hanging spot, and this can be achieved with branches and twigs or attaching a form of netting or mesh. You might need to clean water stains or debris from the side of the setup from time to time, but please don't use any chemicals as this could lead to death if ingested by your mantis. You can make a 50-50 mix of white vinegar and water and apply this as a non-toxic solution which will work just fine. On the note of cleanliness, discarded prey items should also be spot clean to inhibit mould growth. For substrate, there's several options. Primarily, the substrate is going to hold moisture and provide humidity in the environment which is essential for a healthy mantis. You can keep it as simple as paper towels or if you want a more natural look, decorate with cocoa fibre or any popular branded invert substrate. As you may have heard, mantids don't tolerate being housemates very well, and if kept together would likely result in one eating the other. It is possible for certain species to be kept together, the most popular being ghost mantids. However, I would highly advise against this as a beginner, as some will likely outpace the others in growth, and this can lead to cannibalism if not separated. For beginner species, you shouldn't require any independent heat sources. This will vary depending on the region that you're from, but in general, house temperature will suit them just fine. If you're comfortable, then your mantis likely is too. Specifically, the range should be between 22 and 27 degrees centigrade, so if you feel your house gets colder than these temperatures, then an additional heat source may be required. This can come in the form of a heat lamp or a heat mat on a low setting placed on the side of the enclosure. Just ensure you're using a thermostat to keep the temperature consistent. And at night time, you can drop this temperature by 5 degrees or so. Humidity can feel intimidating as it's difficult to measure, but a good rule of thumb is to keep your substrate moist but not soggy, so if you see it drying out, it's time to add some water. I usually have to do this once a week and a little more often in the summer months. To help with the humidity upkeep, you should also mist the sides of the enclosure every other day. Mantids can take hydration from their prey, however this should be supplemented to prevent potential dehydration. Often this can be paired with misting the enclosure as it will provide the mantis with an opportunity to drink. When I mist, I'll do this around the mantis too, so some droplets gather on the mantis directly. This will ensure it is drinking and also aid with the softening of the exoskeleton when it's approaching a molt. They might not like this spritz, but it's better than getting molting issues in the future. If you notice your mantis eagerly taking on water as soon as you mist, this might be a sign that you should mist a little more often just to keep them more hydrated. When it comes to what to feed your mantis, from my experience there is nothing better than flies. 
These range in size from fruit flies for newborn nymphs to house flies, then green bottles, and eventually the bigger blue bottles or blow flies. I have an entire video that talks around obtaining, maintaining, and management of feeder flies, which I'll link in the description. If you're keeping a large species, you might graduate them onto medium sized dubia roaches or locusts. A good rule to go by is that your mantis will want something roughly the size of its abdomen and can eat surprisingly large prey compared to their own size. It's a good idea to supplement their diet with the occasional mealworm or waxworm as they're high in fat, however, this shouldn't be something they're fed exclusively. You can also try putting some honey on a cocktail stick now and again as a sweet treat, which they'll always enjoy. Please don't be tempted to feed your mantis crickets. This can lead to death as crickets can be notorious for carrying bacteria. They also carry a lot of parasites which can transfer onto your mantis. I've read many stories of cricket fed mantises developing all kinds of problems so in general steer clear of these particularly when purchased from pet stores as you've got no idea of the conditions they've came from and the mites that they may carry. You might be tempted to catch something from outdoors to give to your mantis. In general this is something that should be avoided. There's a chance that bug's been in contact with some chemicals or pesticides whilst in the wild and whilst it might not be likely it's just an unnecessary risk. You also wouldn't want to risk your mantis being bitten or stung by anything that has a way to defend itself so in my opinion it's best to stick with flies wherever possible. When you feed your mantis you can usually place the feeder insect inside its enclosure and in time the mantis will catch its prey. You might want to tweeze a feed it yourself too which can be a skill in itself. Mantis are motion based hunters and won't strike something unless it's moving so you may have to wiggle the fly around if it's not moving itself to prompt a response. They have stereoscopic vision like us so try holding the prey at different distances. If your mantis backs away from the prey or doesn't seem interested then it might not be hungry or preparing to molt. If that's the case you can skip a feed and try again next time. Beginner species will usually do fine being fed a meal the size of its abdomen twice a week. It's easy to judge when a mantis is in need of a feed as its abdomen will become more flat rather than round and plump. If you feel that your mantis is looking full it likely is and can skip a feed. These are primarily opportunistic hunters and wouldn't have prey as readily available in the wild so there's no harm in skipping a feed once in a while. It's unlikely you will overfeed your mantis as they will usually discard a prey item if finished with it. However this should be avoided where possible just to minimise the risk of rupturing their abdomen as a fall could lead to injury if they're too swollen with food. Once a mantis reaches adulthood it will no longer need to grow so you can reduce its feeding to an appropriate meal once per week. As your mantis grows it will need to molt its exoskeleton so it's important to be aware of what signs to look out for and how to prepare. A newly hatched mantid will molt after a few weeks and this incrementally gets longer as it matures, entering its final cycle to adulthood taking 2-3 to three months. It varies between mantids but these beginner species go through this process 6 times before emerging as winged adults. With the correct setup you'll have left ample space for the mantis to slip out of its exoskeleton and emerge into the next stage of its life cycle. Your mantis will likely refuse food when preparing to molt and appear to be more sluggish. You might notice a slight fading in colour as the formal shell detaches and spot visible signs of the mantis's abdomen pulsing as it attempts to remove its old casing. Once the mantis emerges it will be very soft and vulnerable so it's important to leave it alone for a few days without feeding or handling just to give it the time it needs to harden. If you notice your mantis exhibiting this behaviour don't interfere with it unless absolutely necessary as it will likely do more harm than good. Sometimes things can go wrong and the mantis may fall during a molt. If this happens you can attempt to help it back to a high perch and gain its footing so it can hang to complete the hardening process. There are occasions where the mantis may have had issues molting and there's a few things we can consider to help it recover and live a healthy life. If a mantis has the ability to hang and feed usually it will be able to resolve its issues in later molts. So if your mantis has leg or raptorial deformities that aren't too severe check its behaviour and see if it's still able to catch its prey. They can usually do this even if only one raptor is functional. There's examples out there where a mantis has had two of its legs stuck in a molt requiring amputation but if this is at an early stage of its life it's able to grow them back. There's a great example of this that I'll link in the description. The majority of the time however if the conditions are correct your mantis will molt with no problems. They've had millions of years of evolution to perfect the process and you just need to trust them to do their thing. There are distinct features you can spot on your mantis as it matures to tell if it's a male or female. This can be quite diverse between species, however in general you can look at the segmented parts of the underside of its abdomen as an indication. Males will have 8 segments whereas females have 6 segments. Upon adulthood males will also have wings that extend further past the end of its abdomen and appear more slim compared to its female counterpart. 
This can be hard to gauge on younger mantids, so you might need to wait for it to grow a little. There are other telltale signs some species exhibit, for example male ghost mantids have a longer crown tapering into a kink in the centre, compared to the females which is more rectangular. Mantids are great for handling, and these beginner species shouldn't pose any issues, but here's a few guidelines to bear in mind. These are very fragile creatures that can be easily injured, so it's best to try and coax them out of their enclosure with a stick or something similar, as opposed to trying to grab them. Encourage them to walk onto your hand, otherwise they may become defensive or try to run away. You'll find it only takes a little encouragement to tempt them out, and often they willingly walk onto your presented hand. Try holding your hand above them, as they will often try and climb upwards. Beginner mantids will usually be very docile, but they can have a burst of speed if they want to, and on occasion may hop. It's best to be prepared for this by handling them away from anything that may hurt them, or any areas they might be able to escape to. If you're handling an adult mantis that has its wings, be prepared that it could attempt to fly, particularly if it's a male. They really aren't adept flyers and will not go far, however they do tend to head towards light, so just ensure any windows are closed as a precaution. You might notice your mantid leaning forward putting its mouth to your skin, which can seem intimidating but it's not trying to bite you. It's likely thirsty and sensing moisture or salt on your skin, so it's attempting to drink. A smaller mantis won't hurt you, and at worst a large mantis could give you a small nip, but it's highly unlikely. However, if it is something you're concerned about, just give your mantis a spritz of water before handling so it can hydrate itself. It's also a good idea to wash your hands before handling to avoid having anything nasty on your skin that could hurt the mantis, just be sure to thoroughly rinse any soap off. If you have a female mantis, upon reaching adulthood she'll begin to get very swollen in preparation to lay a new theca. This is the egg sac that contains potential young. A mantis will produce this regardless of whether she is mated or not, but if she has not been fertilised then the egg sac will be dormant and not produce any young. Some mantids are parthenogenic, which means they can produce young in the form of clones of themselves even without mating. However, with beginner species, this isn't a concern. If you see a mantis has produced its utheca, leave it for a few days and it will turn from a foamy consistency to a hardened capsule. Once hardened, you can remove it from the enclosure if you desire. They may lay further utheca during their adult stage, so bear this in mind if your mantis appears to be fat, it may just be carrying eggs. As a last thing, you can be doing everything right and your mantis could still die. These are insects that produce hundreds of young, and in the wild very few of those would survive through to adulthood. If your mantis passes away, just review your conditions and set up and see if there's anything you think may have caused it, and make the necessary amendments. In the right parameters, female mantids can live well over a year, with males a few months behind. I really hope this guide was useful and was composed from common questions I've seen around the hobby from first time keepers. These insects are one of the most fascinating and curious invertebrates available and make a great pet for children and adults alike. If you have any questions, put them in the comments below and I'll answer them as best I can. I'd encourage you to join Mantid Keeping forums and Facebook groups too, as there's a lot of information out there about specific issues that you might be facing. If you like this kind of content and you want to stay up to date with the developments of my own collection of invertebrates, I post videos at least once a week, so consider subscribing. But thanks for watching, stay safe, and I'll see you on the next one.